Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of uh, Christian Hansen, we very much welcome you to our uh, uh, first Bacillus Symposium to try to go a little deeper to find out about these, uh, these good bacteria that can benefit um, the animal health industry and particularly the poultry industry. Uh, my name is John Dickerson and uh, I lead the folks that do the poultry work in, in North America and uh, we also have colleagues in South America and around the world. Along with me on my team, we have sales managers here today, uh, Jimmy Clark, Kelly Petty, and uh, Fernando Alaruja from Brazil. And we also have um, our nutritionist that works with us, poultry scientist, uh, Dr. Herb Kling. And I know you folks know some of them way better than, than myself, but uh, we all uh, uh, get around to see different people at, at different times. Um, we've got, uh, we're very fortunate today to have uh, the three gentlemen that are going to speak on various aspects of the bacillus. And to introduce our first speaker, speakers, uh, we'd like to welcome uh, David Harrington, our Global Poultry Products Manager. David? Our second speaker this evening is Dr. Lars Molbeck. Hopefully that's okay, my Danish isn't very good. Um, Lars is our R&D manager for our innovation group in Christian Hansen, Animal Health and Nutrition. He's in charge of the group that looks at new product development and product testing. Okay, so he's the guy that comes up with the new stuff. Before joining Christian Hansen, Lars was working at the University of Copenhagen, heading up a group of five researchers looking at pre- and probiotics in monogastrics. So Lars, please. Thanks. It's all yours. Yes, hello everyone. And I'm also very happy to be here and to share some of our experience at uh, Christian Hansen and how we are working with uh, our bacillus strains. And uh, my title today is uh, Why are some uh, bacillus strains better than others as probiotics? So I will divide the presentation in two parts. The first one uh, will come into some of the things also Simon mentioned about bacillus species, the features and benefits as direct fed microbials. And then the second part, I will go more into the details about how do we actually find the new winner strain and how we work with the strains. Just a little bit to set the scene again. So we'll talk about bacillus as the genus, go down to species, and finally at the strain level, where we actually have uh, our product names. And in the EU, all bacterial feed additives should be registered at strain level. And as uh, Simon already has said, uh, we are mainly working with uh, bacillus species that are on the QPS list in, uh, in Europe and on the grass list in, uh, in the US. So where is it we want the mode of action? Uh, we mainly want to see the probiotics work in the small intestine, in the Zika, and down to the cloaca. So we have the spores passing and then they will germinate. Some will also pass by spores, and as we just heard, that can also be quite effective in itself. And then uh, we will get out here in the end. And I will not go too much in details here because Simon has already mentioned some of the ways that probiotics may work. We heard about colonization resistance, and that can both be like directly or indirectly. So that means uh, it can actually either uh, prevent the pathogens to adhere to the tissue, use their nutrients, for example, or can be more indirectly, for example, to stimulate the immune system, as we heard, or to improve tight junctions, or even to, uh, to stabilize the bacterial flora that are already there, so we get an even better bacterial flora. Finally, uh, they can produce and degrade metabolites, and that way improve nutrient utilization and digestibility. But in the end, all this is, of course, theory, and we can prove it in studies. What we are interested in is that we are improving the growth performance, the daily weight gain, and the feed conversion ratio. If that's not working, it's no good about the probiotics. So that's really the key, and also to improve the overall intestinal performance. So why are we using bacillus? And again, Simon has already mentioned some of the points. Bacillus are actually having a quite big genome compared to, for example, uh, lactobacilli. They have from 3,000 to 6,000 genes. 
where normally lactobacillus have from 1,800 to 3,100 genes. That means they have a really big toolbox. They can do a lot of different things. Then finally also, bacillus are very robust. They are fast growers. Uh, they can reduce uh, oxygen fast. They can tolerate bile and, and acids, mainly in the spore forms. And also then they have this very complex uh, way, of act, uh, way of working. So they can go from vegetative cells to, to spore forms and forth and back, and they can produce many different types of enzymes. Uh, which all, all will improve the animal's uh, growth. So now I will go a little bit into what are the differences when at strain level. And I will take uh, this study that was made by Hugh and just recently published. And he looked at 17 totally or fully genome sequenced uh, Bacillus subtilis. And what he found was that there was quite some genetic variation actually among, among all these different strains. And he listed then the uh, open reading frames, which are the potential genes present. And he showed there were around 3,300 that were shared among these different, uh, three different species here. But each of them also had their own specific genes, which could do different things. And among the different uh, strains here, there are also shared genes. So this actually shows there is a potential to find the right strains that can do the things we like them to do. So how do we then find these winner strains that are doing what we like them to do? The normal way we're doing is to have a big bacterial input and that can either come from uh, Christian Hansen's private culture bank where we have more than 16,000 uh, deposits and there are many different uh, types of uh, bacteria and also we have some fungi or we can go out and look in the environment and find perhaps the right strains we like to have. Then it's very important, the next step, and I will come back to that, that's the phenotypic screening. We have to be very clear what it is we want to have from our strains, and then we have to test for it in order to find the right features. And if and when we find these right phenotypic uh, traits, it's also important that we can produce the the new bacterial strain in big scale because it's no good if we cannot get it up and get a product out there. And finally, and the most important, is that we test it at the farms. So how do we do the testing is by high, high throughput uh, phenotypic screening. And we have a department in uh, Christian Hansen that is doing these things. And many f uh, they're mainly using these uh, robotic platform with automatic pipetting and uh, sampling handling in order to do the assays. And we can test for many different features. And here we just listed some of them, like pH tolerance, uh, bile resistance, antibiotic resistance, growth kinetics, and so on. So that means we are generating a lot of data. And one example of one of the data is uh, set is here about enzyme uh, uh, production by cellulase. And this was uh, a collaboration we had with Copenhagen University and has recently been published. And here we can see the different uh, bacillus species, amyloxation, for example, cumulus uh, lixniformis. And we can see there is quite some variation, both among the different species, but also inside the different species, so different strains having different features. So you can imagine now that we have this data set. We are testing all the different other things. We can test immunity as well, and so on. That means we create a huge display of data so then how then to go on and then really find the strain we like to have in nature, or na as a new product, sorry. We use complex data analysis, and that is mainly, uh, for example, PCA, multivariate data analysis. This can look a little bit complex, this, this figure, but I will just show you how it, it works. So each dot represents one bacterial strain. So we have many strains. I think there are 260 strains tested here. Then each color represents a bacillus species. So up here, the light blue is, for example, uh, bacillus amyloxations. And they are like clustering together. We have subtilis, the orange dots here. And there are some variation among the different uh, strains uh, inside the species. And what we have on the x and y axis are some key variables, parameters, that we rate very high. And then you can see that if you have like all these data sets, then you can combine them in different ways and then really find the key parameters that you like to test. But of course, we have to go back to the farm. We find the strain that we think is working. And then we have to test it there. 
we have to do it in meta studies. It's not enough just to do one trial and then see it's working. We have to test it again and again under different conditions in order to know that this is actually going to be a winner. And if it's not working, then it's back again, choose another strain. But then the data we actually generated from the farm studies can also be added to this meta analysis as well. So we actually can figure out which features is it we like to have. So what I hope to show today is that bacillus species are superior probiotic feed additives for poultry and pigs due to their big genomes that have a big toolbox. They are spore producers and they can improve the overall intestinal performance. And finally, that bacillus strains are different. And there we have to look at both the genetic potential, the phenotypic performance, and that actually we have to prove it in the end on the farms in order to get a new product. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Molvik.